Now, Rick was a good friend and a colleague of the mentor of the L5 Society, one of the precursor organizations to the National Space Society. The, Nas uh, the National Space Institute was the other. Uh, he was the, uh, uh, you know, with working with Dr. Gerard K. O'Neill. Uh, he is uh, one of the founding trustees of the X Prize Trust. He has been a frequent uh, testifier before Congress on uh, uh, space advocacy uh, in space-related policy issues. Um, and uh, he's one of the co-founders of the Space Frontier Foundation. I count him as a friend and a colleague that knows the meaning of and the value of making constructive trouble. <laughs> the, um, and, you know, I guess simply put, you know, he also understands that leading the revolution is better than following the wrong pirate. <laughs> You'll understand that better after the clip. So, at this point, uh, Rick's presentation tonight is actually on God and rockets. government spent billions of dollars going to the moon they got there um, and you know just as they got there everybody got colored television sets and they got to the moon it was pretty well black and white 1972 Apollo 17 last mission on the moon and during the Nixon administration shut it down we as Apollo's children felt we were Apollo's orphans we had been left out in the cold it was over in the government's minds but a lot of young kids there myself included were ready for what was next The right chemistry, the right mix, the right matrix of people, of vision, wealth, courage, a little bit of craziness, okay, a whole lot of craziness, teamed up and said, let's go do something important. Let's change the future. Walt pulled together an ad hoc group of people that he knew, and it wasn't so much company, it was more kind of entourage. It was like they came out of a band. Here we were going to negotiate a deal to open a frontier in a place that felt like a frontier at the time. Here you had a serious situation to take over the manned space station. Would you like the space station? Because I think we can get it. We had a mega business plan that was going to grow into probably the biggest business plan ever. The audacity of leasing a 130-ton space asset and privatizing it is, is the realm of science fiction. The pressure was incredible. The Russians were being squeezed hard by the United States government to take the mirror out. Gus said, you're a doomed man if you do this. They are going to come after you with everything they got. Thanks, Gary. I love technology. Uh, we just found out that the only way to dim the lights, because they're compact, for, compact fluorescence, is to completely black out the place. So I tell you what, can we just real quick take it down and see what it looks like? And if it's really bad, we'll just go into B mode. You know what? Leave it at that. Let's go with the visuals. Let's start this thing. You know, we worked on that mirror project, so uh, this is my little favorite thing to do. So, welcome to the revolution. There you go. We'll get the sucker back on track. Never doubt that a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. Here you are. So, yeah, some of you more and less thoughtful than the others, but definitely committed. This is the book that brought us all together in the 70s. Interesting time in the 70s. We had just finished the success of Apollo, and in the air was an anticipation, because great things were about to happen in space. Incredible access to space was about to be provided. We were all gonna get the chance to go, because there was this great technology coming down the pike called the space shuttle. 
It was gonna fly 50 times a year. Our dreams were gonna be possible. We were gonna be able to build space colonies and a lot of imaginations just went wild based on those possibilities. And you know what, what, what I call the conspiracy of dreamers began during that period of time. There were a lot of us that came together under Dr. O'Neill. A lot of us had uh, very disparate backgrounds. Uh, we had people who were engineers, people who were scientists, people who were philosophers, people who were in medicine, all kinds of people, people in the military, et cetera, et cetera, came together under the idea that we could expand beyond the Earth. And that's what this is all about, expanding beyond the Earth. In fact, this is a great statement. I love it. I'll let you read it for yourselves. Well, actually, we will create self-sustaining and economically viable human communities beyond the Earth, an expanding frontier where the power of human imagination can be unleashed, and a future where the human race can tap the unlimited resources and energy of space to create wealth and opportunity for all mankind. That's an incredibly visionary statement. Now, I have to tell you, that statement was ginned up at a NASA conference in Washington, D.C. several years ago. Now, uh, there were several groups that were there. there were, everybody was broken into groups to go talk about what was possible. We had planetary scientists. We had all kinds of people working together. We had uh, Mars people. We had settlement people. We had policy people. We had NASA people. We had people of, of all sorts. And every group came back with a statement that was somewhat like this. Unfortunately, on the day the reports were given, the people from headquarters at NASA unfortunately had another appointment and weren't there to hear it. But that's what it's all about right there. And it's a shared vision. I think we all have that vision. Now, the interesting thing is, given that we have this vision, and, and believe me, I believe O'Neill had this vision. I think underneath Von Braun had this vision. I think he eventually, even though originally he was all for toasters in space, even Carl Sagan had this vision. They all eventually came around to the idea that human race should expand beyond the planet. And we decided to place all of our bets on this pony right here, the shuttle, a government program that unfortunately, even though we're in the last phases, is a magnificent machine, I should say. It's an amazing machine. I salute the people that fly it. Many of my friends are shuttle pilots and, and people that are on the crews, and we've lost some very valiant people. The people that build it, the people that refurb it, the people that do the work are incredible people. But we have to admit it was a complete failure as a program. It was supposed to fly 50 times a year. It didn't, it still doesn't, and you know, gosh, it's gonna be done soon. So there's something new in the air, and it's a good time coming up ahead of us. So you see, the problem is a government program that took us to the moon, shall we say a socialist program, was maybe good back in the 60s, but it's not going to get us to where we want to go now. In fact, if we go the same route that we're going, or that we have gone with the shuttle, if the government does DOS program and we all climb on board and salute that program and it begins to carry us, forward if it succeeds, if the money's not wasted, if it actually flies anything and may actually get us to Mars. Oh, by the way, you know the reason that people, uh, there's a generation that says, other than a Fox TV show, that, uh, that we didn't go to the moon? The reason, the biggest reason of all, is why aren't we there? Why aren't we there? The self-evident proof that we went to the moon would be that we're still there and expanding beyond it. But we don't, we aren't. That's why Fox can run a TV show and cause a bunch of people to think we never went. If, if, if we were able to pull together the current government program and actually get to Mars using the current approach that had been put out there in the last few years, we might get there. And 30 years afterwards, we'd have that. <laughs> and a, you know, a three-dimensional holographic Fox television show telling us that we never went to Mars and a generation that would believe it. Why? Because we wouldn't be able to stay. In fact, there's two models I like to look at. There's the way we've done space and the way we've done the internet. Two completely different approaches. Here's the way that we, um, if, if we approached the internet the way we've done space, this is what we'd have. In fact, there'd be one of them here. This is the, uh, the United States National Computer Enterprise uh, and a computonaut who would be running it for us and you'd be lined up for a thousand miles with your punch cards trying to get in there and you know, see if you could iterate your program just a little bit more if you didn't get it bounced by DOD or a senator who wanted to go and junk it into space. That's, that's the way we approach space. But that's not how we approached the internet. What we did was we took the technology developed by the government and we gave it to the people. And the people did amazing things with it. The people went wild with it. Some of them were a little bit distasteful, which is why the government could never do them. You know, credit card processing was created by pornographers originally on the internet, but hey, it worked. Um, now, so what we did was we gave the technology to the people. 
and the people went wild. And now we talk about useless things millions of times a day all over the world. But we created something. We created an amazing thing. Ah, you know what? There's a recent example that's even better, and I'll talk about that for a second. I'll come back to this slide in a second. I was sitting there recently uh, reading uh, Time Magazine about how we, did, how we got bin Laden. Perfect, perfect concept right there. The way we spear pointed, that we went in there and we took out bin Laden was a very efficient, highly complex, very well acted out uh, government operation of, of incredible specialization that went in and took off the spiritual leader of a movement. But you know what changed or is changing the entire culture of the Middle East? Tools created by free enterprise, Google, Facebook, and Twitter. American free enterprise leveraging off of American high technology created for the military is what's really transforming the philosophy of the world right now. That's the model we have to follow in space. So here are a couple of principles I like to talk about. Space is a place, not a program. In free enterprise democracies, opportunities are exploited by individuals or groups in the form of companies and, pub and private institutions. Frontiers are not opened by governments for the people, but by the people supported by or in spite of their governments. And without extremely low cost, reliable, and regular access to space, there could be no frontier. And of course, the last one, no buck, no buck Rogers. Nobody stays until somebody pays. Now that can be the taxpayers or it can be customers. That guy you saw in the first slide, Dennis Tito, he was a customer. That's all, he was a customer, he was a person who is buying a ride to help us develop an infrastructure that is economically self-sustaining. Uh, I think as my, my friend Peter uh, Diamandis talks about, uh, organically uh, self-programmed, self-loading uh, payloads. So it's a face is a frontier. To me, NASA is Lewis and Clark. And we are the pioneers. We're the settlers and the shopkeepers. We're the ones who follow behind Lewis and Clark. And I want NASA to get back to that job. Now, the one thing that the settlers and shopkeepers are ready to do now, because we've been there for a long time, is get 100 miles up. 100 miles up and you're halfway to anywhere. Robert Heinlein, one of the greatest authors in science fiction. Halfway to anywhere, because it's pretty well all downhill from there. It's all sliding into gravity wells after that. Well, that's what we have to take care of. That's where the private sector should go. That's where Lewis and Clark has done their job. Anything else is, as a friend of mine, Thomas Paine, who used to be a NASA administrator, said to me once, and, and a friend of mine, Jim Muncy, on a phone call, say anything else is basically going around in circles waiting for something to fall out of the sky again. That's not the government's job. The government shouldn't drive trucks and build buildings. The government should invest our treasure in doing things that none of us can do individually and that don't make sense for the bottom line of any company to do, to go beyond the horizon and come back and tell us what's there. So when we did Mir, that's what we were doing. We were trying to get into space. And then we could work from there. We, were gonna, we weren't about tourism. That was just a way to pay the rent. That's how we ran into Tito. We couldn't figure out how to pay the rent. What we were going to do was build a facility that was going to service satellites, and eventually we were going to go out and grab an asteroid. That was the bottom of the business plan for the Mir deal. Now, orbital industrial infrastructure, that's what we need. By the way, this is a Boeing slide just for fun. Hey, Gordon, how you doing? Um, but this is a Boeing slide. And an old one, by the way. But the idea is to be able to do things in orbit, to build, to develop, to access, to create a port system. Remember, when we came to the New World this last time, what had happened was they were basically extending capabilities they already had. They had had a complex system of trade up and down the coasts of Europe and around the coast, the edges of Africa, et cetera, et cetera. They knew what they were doing. They knew how to build ships. They knew how to hire crews or impress crews. They knew how to build sails. They knew how to navigate. They were getting better and better at it. They had government institutions to back them up. They had banking institutions. They knew how to bring together investors, like the Space Investment Symposium people are trying to do. They knew how to do all that. They had the social governmental mechanisms that allowed them to then just extend it and move into this, quote, unquote, new world here much to the chagrin of people who were already here didn't know they needed to be discovered, but. <laughs> I was there for this beautiful moment. This is Spaceship One flying out over Mojave. This is the new moment we're in. This is our decade's new moment. Except this time what we're betting on is not a government to do it for us, but a combination of government and private sector right now being led by the private sector to get out there and allow us to do it. It's messy. It makes bureaucrats crazy. They can't understand it. They don't know. I saw recently an astronaut 
uh, who was quoted, who said that these people are hobbyists. They're just hobbyists building rockets. By that token, he's just a government employee who got a taxpayer-funded junket to the moon. Okay? These are not hobbyists. You go to one of these companies. You go to Mojave. You go to x -Corp, You go to Armadillo. You go to any of these companies out there. They can't pay these guys to go home from work. They have no social life. They're building rockets. Their passion is as great as any one of the masses that worked in the 60s to take us to the moon. It's an amazing thing that's happening. We remember this one. This is Virgin doing their flight. Um, one of the things I tried to capture in a little piece that I did recently, a little video, was uh, to show what this was like. And I just want to play a two-second video so you don't have to listen to me for a couple of seconds. We choose to go to the moon. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other things, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. startups to established leaders, we will work with a growing array of private companies competing to design and build and launch new means of carrying people and materials out of our atmosphere. The space race will once more inspire wonder in a new generation, sparking passions and launching careers, reaching for new heights, stretching beyond what previously did not seem possible. Well, we distinguish ourselves by accomplishing what we try to do. We play to win. Jeff is the super genius. Dan is the fantastic engineer. Doug's a rocket whisperer, and I'm mom. Three, two, one. We're a small R&D shop, and we build computer-controlled rocket ships. They're very unnatural-looking rockets. These are really just the incremental steps that take us to the real goal, which is people in outer space in orbit. That goal will serve to organize and measure the best of our energies and skills, because that challenge is one that we're willing to accept, one we are unwilling to postpone, and one we intend to win. All right, video, back. there we go. So what we've got is a new generation that's actually reaching for the stars based on the inspiration of the previous generation, standing on the shoulders of giants, many of whom actually worked here, many who actually spent their lives here trying to do it the first time around. These guys have gone out, these are people who grew up, these are the geeks of the 60s. They went out, they formed their computer companies, they made it through the computer meltdown, they've come back in, and uh, now they want to do something grand. This is Jeff Bezos' company. That's uh, uh, Blue Origins out, he owns a chunk of West Texas, the size of, I think, Long Island, uh, that he's trying to fly out of, uh, out of there on. Um, Xcor, Mojave, you just saw a picture of them. What I love too, look at the different, they're all different. Mao may have said let a thousand flowers bloom, but we're actually letting a thousand, thousand rockets fly. And I think it's pretty exciting. That's Armadillo. And of course, SpaceX. Bob Bigelow, who you'll have tomorrow night, another one of the leaders. An amazing guy. So we're all doing it. We're all going up a hundred different ways to get a hundred miles up. It's all coming. And it's coming now. And there's a new generation. You may have noticed there's a lot more young people suddenly in the last few years starting to show up at these conferences. Yeah, a lot of them are doing slave labor at the conference, but that's how they can afford to get there. That's how I did it the first time. I was sitting back there on a camera going, please, please, can I hang out with the space people? Anyway, so what I did, just an idiot like me, I went out and I got a company together too because it's about opportunity. Everybody else wants to go build rockets. I figured, well, you know, they're going to need Levi's. So we came up with a spacesuit company. Orbital Outfitters. We rolled out the world's first fully commercial spacesuit in 2007. We got a little ahead of our market, but they're catching up with us eventually. So that's the uh, IS-3, the Industrial Suborbital Spacesuit right there. That's, uh, it doesn't look very different. You'll notice the slenderizing black panels on the waist. Um, <laughs> but it doesn't look a lot different, but it's our idea of a, it's an iPod. There's so much underneath that thing that is different. 
It's a composite helmet that weighs you know, less than a, one of these pictures at the table here. Uh, four or five people could stand on it. It's an amazing thing. Ingenuity applied in a free market concept or a free market realm. This is the uh, participant suit. 3D cameras, iPods, 30 minutes of oxygen provided on the body, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Little pads so you can bump your head. Uh, the 3D cameras so you can take pictures of yourself throwing up in full three dimensions into your vomit bag. <laughs> Anyway, so then there was something else I, uh, I went off and worked on. Uh, this is called Space Diver. Uh, it's been a slow start, but uh, we're gearing back up. We're getting onto it in a big way. Uh, very excited about it. This is the new vision of the program. Can we have the second video, please? That's coming. I would say probably within the next three years that'll happen. Thank you. Go back to the video, the production here. Um, in the meantime, our government is also looking upwards at a viable goal. New Earth objects, kill or be killed, eat or be eaten. Um, I think it's viable. I think it's, it's, that's a role for government right now. Go out there. Let's, let's send out something and uh, see what we can do. If the private sector doesn't beat you, they're great. But uh, I, I think that's a, a great project, the idea of going out, uh, sending human beings to try and uh, understand something that could actually destroy the entire planet. That is a higher level of cultural profit at that point. And yes, that's the vehicle. I think that's uh, Orion, if I recall correctly. Um, in its proper use, by the way. I'm one of these people that believes Orion should never go up and down from Earth to space. It should stay in space. Why? Because we have private companies who can do that perfectly well. Thank you very much. We don't need it for that. Go out there and do Lewis and Clark. Okay? We don't need Lewis and Clark paddling up and down you know, the streets of Manhattan. We're already there. We're coming. We're here. Okay? Go. Go to the frontier. Do your job. Then there's the moon. The moon. I, I love the moon, obviously. Did a little book on that a while back. Private sector is probably going to get there first. It's, it's interesting. Uh, Richard talked about that today a little bit. Um, I do believe, I'm going to make a couple of predictions that I, I actually believe. The next uh, lander on the moon will be an American, a, a private lander inspired by or operated by an American company. Um, by the way, I believe the next U.S. space facility will be a commercial U.S. space facility. Guy building it will be here tomorrow night. Got two modules in orbit, which is great, by the way. He's testing long-term duration, etc. Um, the next vehicle that will orbit the moon will be operated by an American commercial company. I think it's an exciting time coming. So we're going to see all kinds of good things starting to happen. I love this. I love green in space. I am a bona fide 
tree hugger. Deal with it. <laughs> then there's Mars. I also believe, and I'll, I'll hang it out there on this one, I think that it's quite possible that the first human being to walk on Mars will be a private citizen sent there by a rocket built by a private U.S. company on a private mission. Write it down, call me in five years or ten years if it doesn't happen. But I want to see it happen. I love Mars. I, Zubrin and I go back and forth about it sometimes, but I love it. I think it's great. I, I, want to, I want to see it. I don't care whether that one's a government or private sector, really. I just want to see it. I want to see the live view of the Val Marineris as the, as the lady is standing there looking over the cliff and it's coming through her 3D cameras and we get to watch it live. I want to see that. I'm a free space kind of guy underneath though, I got to tell you. I'm an, a hardcore O'Neillian in a sense. I believe free space is where the action is going to be. I want to see us mining the asteroids. I want to see that kind of thing happening. I want to see us beginning to build in space. Some of these are old images, by the way, but we're coming back. I want to see this kind of beautiful cities in space. Keep in mind, when you're in zero G, you can do anything. Unlimited resources compare, co co combined with unlimited imagination. Unlimited resources, unlimited imagination, unlimited capabilities. That's what we have. That's what we'll be able to apply to space. We can build anything, any size, anywhere. We're only limited by our imaginations. Canvas of space is a blank canvas. You bring your paintbrush, you bring your tools, you bring your imaginations, you harvest the resources of space, and you make of it what you will, where you will and how you will. Our job right now is to protect the baby. Protect the baby. This new space dream, this new thing that we see being created, this thing born out of the visions of Apollo, inspired in the hearts of a generation, that inspired the hearts of a generation that grew up and have come back. Some of you people have been in this movement for 30 more years. You're still here. What drives you? What gets you to this place? What has you in this room? The dream has you in this room. It's the dream that has me in this room. It's what it's all about. Look at that. That's all out there. You know, they say there's billions and billions and billions of stars. More stars than all of the grains of sand on all of the beaches and all of the deserts on the entire planet. They're out there waiting for us. Some of you say, well, you know, ET's out there and they're coming to us. Well, I don't understand, you know, look. E.T., great. I don't know why he keeps showing up in Arizona with two guys named Bubba in a pickup truck. I don't get that. <laughs> I hope they're watching our movies so they know how they're supposed to act and dress and what kind of vehicles they should have. Have you noticed that? They're all like, you know, one movie comes out and they all look like that. I believe we're E.T. I believe, it's interesting, I helped get some funding at one point for a group named SETI that's out there looking for these people. They can't find them. Where are they? Fermi's paradox, if they're out there, they should be everywhere, but they're nowhere, we're not finding them. Why? Why? I wanna challenge your assumption that they're everywhere and say maybe they're nowhere. Maybe ET is here in this room. You know, according to the Big Bang, the entire galaxy was started at the same time. So there is a possibility that we're the first civilization to make it to this point. Think about all the things that can go wrong. You have to be in the sweet spot. You have to have a planet that's orbiting a, uh, a, the right kind of sun, that's putting out the right kind of radiation at the right period, and it has to have the right chemical makeup. It has to be hit by the right other chemicals flying in and around it. It has to be empowered, and, and, and uh, the planet has to be rotating in a certain rotation. Oh, in the meantime, the sun can't go nova. There can't be flares that wipe you out. There can't be things that drop in. You know, every 26 million years, apparently something drops in from the thing called the Uart cloud and does a mass extinction event, possibly, here on this planet. That's just to make it to the level of algae. <laughs> then a whole nother set of things has to happen for you to make it to the next level and the next level. And then some slimy little fish turns into a slimy little amphibian and that slimy little amphibian crawls up on the beach and starts to breathe the air which has been converted from a noxious atmosphere to a breathable atmosphere by the 
by the one-celled creatures that have been living in the ocean, et cetera, et cetera. All of that has to happen perfectly, step by step, perfectly, 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 to get to the point, now you've got creatures that are moving around on the land masses, then those creatures have to evolve. Those creatures then have to rise up on their hind legs and throw a whole set of things. That one, you know, doesn't get eaten by the saber-toothed tiger that's gonna be the one who picks up the bone and throws it in the air for 2001. <laughs> it all has to happen perfectly. Maybe we are it. Maybe this is the only planet that's made it this far. Maybe, empirically speaking. I don't care what you want to believe. I don't care what you want to believe. I want to believe it. I want to believe ETs everywhere. You know, I want intelligent life in the universe. I just lived in LA for 14 years, which is an argument against intelligent life here on this planet. <laughs> but I want it everywhere. But I don't see it. So what does that mean? That means the cockroach you stepped on this morning may be the only one anywhere ever, ever created at any time. That means the life of this planet is more precious than you ever imagined possible. It means we have to take care of this tiny jewel we call the Earth. It means that this little biosphere that they turned back from Apollo 8, those heroes turned back from and saw and said, look at that, and that little blue bubble out there, that little blue drop of life in space is precious. And it's our job now. I believe it's our job to carry this life to worlds now dead. That, to me, is a motivation for an entire civilization. In 50 years to 100 years, I believe, I want to see happen, and I'm asking you all to help me make it happen by giving the existence proof of starting to reach out there, to make it allowed out there into space and begin to start this process so the world can see it. I believe that that is the role of the human race one of the roles of the human race. I believe our job is to take the life of Earth and expand it into space, to carry the seeds of life to worlds now dead. Think about that as a motivation. Not, oh, I've got to have bling. Oh, I've got to have a Mercedes. Oh, I've got to run a corporation. Oh, I've got to do this, I've got to do that. No, a child waking up in 100 years could wake up in a culture that says, this is a beautiful place. The species is here for a purpose, a grand and exciting purpose, to carry life outwards. And for the first time, we don't take it from somebody else, we go together. All of us, races, cultures, religions, we go together based on merit, all participating in this grand cause, because there's room for everybody. We plant the seeds of life. We also carry this culture. We carry all of the beautiful things we've done and we try and advance just one tiny, tiny step beyond the bad things we've done. And each time we go further and further, we get a little, maybe just a tiny little bit better at it. We get new places to try cultural experiments. For example, what's the next step after democracy and where do we try it? Can't do it here. Can't go anywhere here that's not somebody else's or doesn't hurt the planet. Let's go out there and try something new. It is a blank canvas. It's your canvas. You've got the brushes. You get to paint on it. It's an exciting time. But what really gets me going is this thought, and bear with me for half a second, it's a little bit philosophical, shall we say it. What if, what if the universe, without sentient beings, in other words, what if the universe, what if there were a universe that had no creatures in it that could understand its own existence? In other words, I believe, purely myself, that we are the sensing mechanisms of the universe. I don't care in a, in a real sense whether your God is, you know, Jehovah or a Catholic God or a bunch of people with togas throwing around lightning bolts. I don't care in that sense. But to me, at the essence of it all, the universe knows of itself by the sentient beings that populate that universe and can report back to it that it exists. Dead rock and energy has no existence. So whether it's us or somebody else on a planet far, far away looking at us at their space conference right now saying, let's get off of our rock, somebody out there has to go out and see and touch and taste and feel and experience. You know, it goes back to this old line. I've heard that, you know, you hear this in, in classes. Um, if a tree falls in the forest, is there a sound? No, there's no sound. 
what happens in a, if a tree falls in the forest is you have a set of organic molecules that are alive or dead. They're translating from a horizontal position or a vertical position to a horizontal position, uh, causing a, a wave to emanate from that. That wave is then intercepted by an ear. That sound then goes into that ear, or what will become the sound, goes into that ear, causes the tympanic membrane to vibrate, a bone to vibrate, that sets off an electrical impulse that goes into a brain, and through a set of associative accidents in, inside of our brain, is interpreted as a thing that we in our culture call sound. And that sound is then identified in a way through a bunch of other sets of interactions with a tree falling. And that then is associated with something like, I love Lumberjacks the show on Discovery, or I hate trees because they fell on my dog. You know, when they fall like that, it just pisses me off. Whatever, it's interpretive. We interpret what is otherwise a dead universe by being sentient. We are God's eyes, hands, ears, and feet. It's our job to get out there. And that's an exciting possibility to me. I believe that if we begin to appreciate that, by the way, that's what gets me up in the morning. I don't know what's kept you guys around for 30 or 40 years, but the idea that there's something about destiny here, something exciting, something that means a lot, that is what gets me going. It's not that I want to bend metal. I love bending metal. I am so honored to be around the engineers that are building these rockets and blowing up stuff and occasionally getting something off the ground and fighting gravity. I think that's really cool. I love hanging around. I've been hanging around Armadillo recently. They told me if I show up again, they're gonna hand me a wrench. I said, hand me a broom, I'll take that. I don't just wanna be around you guys, all right? It's amazing what's going on. These are the heroes of our species. This is the most amazing activity possible in the human race right now. And here we are in a little room acting as if we're somehow unusual or different or we don't fit in. I know, when, I know when I leave here and I try and go tell people in my family what, what I, oh my God, they just can't understand it. And I know that happens with you. But I want you to understand it here. And I want you to understand it here. And if you're an investor, I want you to understand it here. <laughs> Get involved. We have a grand heritage. This place gave us that heritage and other places like this spread across the country. But now it's up to us to take that heritage. It is up to us to stand in the mud from which we arose and reach for the stars. It is up to us to make this happen. It is up to you to make it happen. It is not about rich boys and their toys. It's not about some guy like Dennis Tito at the beginning of this presentation who, who has a bunch of money and he flies in space. It is about a bunch of very creative people that are driven by a dream who are figuring out how to make it work. And that's you. And I salute you for that. Together, we will break out of this planet. Together, we will carry the seeds of life into the universe. Together, we will transform what it means to be a human being. The monkey will climb into a rocket and fly. And our imaginations will show us the way. Thank you.